Please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Let's then to the big breaking story that we're tracking at this hour. All three bidders for Bhushan Power, CNBC TV 18 learns, will submit final bids by end of today. And the Committee of Creditors will be meeting tomorrow to review those bids. Let's bring in Ritu Singh from Mumbai who's joining us with all the latest details. Ritu, thanks for joining in. And what exactly are you picking up? Well, you know, uh, Tata Steel has in the past resisted submitting a revised bid for Bhushan Power because it said it violates the NCLAT uh, order spirit by asking the same players to review their bids. But we understand from sources after NCLAT's last ruling where it directed the three players to submit their final bids by the 13th of August, which is today, uh, all three players have now decided to place their final offers with the IRP of Bhushan Power. Uh, do remember the last bids that were placed were, uh, you know, JSW Steel, had revised its bid upwards to 18,000 odd crores. Uh, Tata Steel's bid stood at 17,000 crore rupees and Liberty House at 18,500 crore rupees. This after, uh, you know, in the earlier round, Tata Steel was the clear favourite, but now JSW Steel has come back in the game, so it remains to be seen whether today uh, there is any further revision from these amounts that the three players had already stated. We do understand from sources that the Committee of Creditors uh, will open these bids tomorrow in their meeting to select the preferred uh, bidder uh, do remember, we also understand that JSW Steel is being supported by State Bank of India when it comes to funding this deal. Uh, and bankers still remain a little apprehensive about Liberty House's bid because there's no clear source of funds that the company has been able to show so far. So uh, in this round between Tata Steel and JSW, the highest bidder, uh, bidder uh, clearly stands an advantage when it comes to acquiring Bhushan Power. All right, Ritu, appreciate you for joining us with all those details. Moving along, India is creating wealth at a furious pace and women are starting to bridge the gap with men. This is the latest finding of a report released by Kotak and Hurun Research Institute, which has ranked India's top 100 wealthiest women. Now, leading that list is Smita V. Krishna of the Godrej Group, a member on the board of Godrej. She has a net worth of over 37,500 crore rupees. At number two is ACL's Roshi Nadar with a net worth of over 30,000 crore rupees. And Indu Jain of the Bennett Coleman Group comes in at number three. Kiran Shaw of Biocon, Kiran Nadar also from the ACL Group completes the top five. And at number six is Lina Tiwari of the USV Group. She's also an MLA in Uttar Pradesh representing Apna Dal. Meanwhile, three cities in Maharashtra, Pune, Navi Mumbai and Mumbai are the most livable places in the country. This according to the Ease of Living Index that was released by the Urban Development Ministry earlier today. Now, the index ranks a total of 111 cities based on four key parameters. Governance, economic factors, social infrastructure and physical infrastructure. So where exactly do the other metros stand when compared to the maximum city? Well, Chennai is ranked 14th on the list, while Bengaluru comes in at a distant 58 on the list. New Delhi, meanwhile, is ranked much lower at 65th spot, and Kolkata did not participate in the index as well. Let's take a quick look at the Hall of Shamers as well. Rampur in Uttar Pradesh is the worst performing city on the Ease of Living Index, followed by Kohima, three cities from the state of Bihar, the capital Patna along with Bihar Sharif and Bhagalpur complete the bottom five in that list. Meanwhile, in less than a week after the demise of DMK chief M. Karuna Nidhi, a power battle has broken out within his family. Now, Karuna Nidhi's second son, M. K. Arugiri, has flexed his muscles, challenging his brother Stalin's claim to the party's top post. Let's bring in Jude Sanath, who's joining us from Chennai with the latest on this tussle. Jude, a pleasure having you on the show. And clearly, Arugiri was removed from the DMK in 2014 itself. But how is his claim being seen within the DMK and in the political circles now? Well, first off, after the events of this morning, it's fair to say Alagiri may have stoked the flames of what could possibly be, at least he'd hope, will be a rebellion within the DMK. And I use the word stoked simply because there aren't many who are taking his threats, quote-unquote, seriously. And here's why. Like you rightly mentioned, Alagiri hasn't quite been part of the DMK since 2014. But before we proceed, let's quickly recap all that he said while visiting Karnanadi's gravesite today. First things first, Alagiri said that as far as Karnanadi's true loyalists are concerned, they are all on his side. 
he even then went on to admit that he wasn't a part of the DMK and would thus not be party to whatever decision the political party takes, but states that as far as his decision or his dissatisfaction with the affairs of the party are concerned will, of course, be known in a few days' time from, there, from, from today. But very interestingly, a few minutes after he made the declaration, he spoke to our sister network, CNN News 18, where he made a couple of very interesting points. First up, he said that all was not well within the rank and file of the DMK with regard to how MK Stalin has been running the party as working president uh, since, of course, Karnanadi became invalid. Secondly, he also mentioned as far as Chennai is concerned, he felt the DMK was slowly losing grasp of this power center that belonged to the party. But very interestingly, even as these allegations are being brought forth by Allegri in the hope to stir about a rebellion, something very interesting to note is that not many within the DMK are taking him too seriously. Let's remember, the rank and file of the party are firmly behind MK Stalin, who has large, who has been seen as Karunanadi's heir apparent for the last decade, at least for now. So even as a crucial DMK council meet is all set to take place tomorrow, we'll have to wait and watch just where MK Allegri intends to go with regard to these comments that he's made. But for now, the party is firmly behind MK Stalin. Back to you.